So interesting, huh? Interesting. Um, all right, so next up, uh, third of four speakers. Uh, she comes to us from the great state of Pennsylvania, and she provides uh, a bit of a unique perspective. I, I actually cannot remember the last time we had a political candidate, a former political candidate, come and, and pierce the veil for us. You know, We see candidates in a certain way, right? We just do. Um, but we thought it'd be fun to ask uh, one of them to come over and talk to us about, about what it's like on their side. And so I want to welcome uh, Christina Hartman to the podium or to the stage. She is at Hartman for PA. And um, she provides, again, an interesting perspective because not only was she a candidate, uh, but she has been on our side as well. So I think what you're going to learn about Christina a little bit is um, some courage. I mean, in my talk, having spoken with her, uh, I learned, you know, she was a behind-the-scenes person just like us. She was an operator just like us. She was working on democracy projects around the world, you know, just like a lot of us have done. And, uh, and then she flipped the switch, and she put herself out there. So with that, Christina Hartman. Thanks so much for having me here today. It's a pleasure. Um, I'm gonna stand by the podium because um, in true candidate form, I've, uh, I've stuck to the TED rules, but sort of have a speech a bit. So to keep you entertained for what seems like an eternity, uh, 12 minutes. So bear with me, whoops, there we go. Um, so as I was preparing for this TED style talk, um, I don't know if you've looked at them before, but there's guidelines. And so uh, the first piece of advice that they give you for a good talk is that your idea can be new or surprising or challenge a belief that your audience already has. And so all I could think is, well, then do I have a story for you? I ran for Congress and I lost. I lost. So why am I standing here? Well, apparently you can't get any other candidates to show up, so maybe that's part of it. Um, <laughs> but really, uh, let me start at the beginning. It was 2011, and I was sitting in South Sudan on a work project, uh, watching the Penn State Jerry Sandusky uh, sexual abuse scandal come out over Twitter. Um, at the same time, Planned Parenthood was uh, being falsely attacked for what seemed like the 700th time. And as I watched all of that unfold, I had a thought that certainly isn't new or surprising. I thought, why do I keep trying to bring the ideals of equality and democracy to people who could just as easily look at my own country and say, you guys don't exactly seem to get it either, do you? Um, our legislators weren't leading our country in a way that I could look to for inspiration and leadership. And my skills, uh, policy, analysis, communication, coalition building, and yes, fundraising, uh, might best be employed to improve the status quo and run for Congress in a place that all of you would call PA 16. We call it home. What most people find immediately surprising about my choice is that I am not a white male over 50 who owns a business or is a lawyer. I am also not a Washington insider. And I'm from a district that has always been considered safe Republican, where the concerns of the places where I've worked, like Central Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa, are rarely a part of the political discussion. So I was up against many entrenched attitudes um, and preconceptions, including one very specific belief held in Pennsylvania's 16th since the early 1800s, that our congressional seat could only be held by a white Republican man. The work was real. I grew up in a suburb of Lancaster City called Manheim Township, a place where a bunch of Reagan Republicans raised a bunch of Obama Democrats who did exactly what they were supposed to do. We used a top shelf public education to get into great colleges, get good jobs in America's most competitive cities, and we used our skills to improve the world. And in fact, that is exactly what I did. And I don't have enough fingers or toes to count the number of classmates who did the same. 
I earned a BA from GW, a master's from Fordham, and I spent the better part of two decades advocating for human rights around the world. I worked with Madeleine Albright's National Democratic Institute. I encouraged low-income kids with dreams of entrepreneurship at Prince Charles's Trust. I supported survivors of domestic violence, sexual assault, and child abuse at Mariska Hargitay's Joyful Heart Foundation. If I could support all of these people, I knew I could help get America's democracy back on track. So for those of you who don't know, Pennsylvania's 16th district is made up of Lancaster, Chester, and Berks counties. And many of you might know um, Lancaster County, it's the most famous one, um, because it's the home to America's very first refugees, the Anabaptists. You might know them better as the Amish and Mennonites who came to our area escaping religious persecution in the 1700s. We're perfectly located. We're an hour to the west of Philly on the Amtrak. We're two hours uh, on a traffic-free day uh, to DC. And we've got three third-tier cities, suburbs, and farmland. We're a beautiful, vibrant, mini America. In 2008, Barack Obama won this district en route to the presidency. Jackpot. This was change. In 2009, a big yoga studio opened up in my hometown, and next to it, a coffee shop. Mm -hmm. And not just a coffee shop. A roastery with goofy stickers and gimmicky logos and gluten-free brownies. And now they're far from the only yoga, yoga and coffee shops in town. And as you all know, where there is yoga and fussy coffee, there are Democrats. Our Hispanic population continues to grow, and transplants continue to move in from larger cities that have become too expensive for their young families. And for whatever reason, all of those transplants are left-leaning. I spent a career assessing political situations in countries around the globe. And the political trajectory of Pennsylvania's 16th looks then as now, solid blue. I met with local party officers in 2015 who were excited for a fighter in a race that was normally poorly funded and seen as a sacrificial lamb. And what's more, the 10-term incumbent would be retiring. So I had a democratic trajectory, an outgoing incumbent, and a presidential election that would have a women, woman at the top of the ticket. Everything was lining up. My FEC paperwork was filed in July of 2015, and we started to run what you all might call a textbook campaign, but I just know it as good business sense. Hire the right people, do the hard work, and create a buzz that cannot be ignored. They might have thought what I was trying to do was crazy. In fact, I know they did, but I hired an amazing team of consultants who believed in me. I was a hungry, outside-of-the-box candidate, and I found media, polling, and mail consultants who were like me, authentic, honest, and hardworking. We navigated the complexities of the local parties, where, my very, where the very first question I was asked uh, by an older gentleman who considered himself quite open-minded, was I married, did I have children, and if so, how was I going to run a campaign? It was at that moment that I realized why the words politics and polite share so many letters. <laughs> we had a good deal to work through. The local paper's endorsement spent three quarters of their space gushing over my candidacy and hoping my opponent would be a better congressman than he was a candidate, and then endorsed him. Personally, I had to overcome the fact that I was never the person out in front. For virtually my whole career, I was a chief of staff. Even back in high school, I was the stage manager of our theater productions, not the lead actress. I considered myself a terrible public speaker. But if I wanted to win and change the trajectory of our country, I was just going to have to get over myself. We worked hard to bring Republicans over to our fight. And that was possible because I was a moderate candidate who was a product of one of the best local public schools and I have both practical experience and policy knowledge to deliver for them on Capitol Hill. I am, after all, what our excellent public school system was meant to produce, an authentic, educated, community-minded public servant. And that, those were the easy parts. I don't have to tell you that fundraising was a slog, but of course I will. <laughs> 
We convinced donor by donor, $100 by $100, and we eventually raised $1.25 million. We started at nothing, and our average contribution was $67. To so many people, I was that sacrificial lamb, but we kept to our plan and we kept our focus and people began talking about me with an ever more serious tone. We, ain't, or we earned major endorsements, and we were put on the DCCC's red to blue list. This kind of momentum, of course, got the attention of the deeper pockets in the Republican Party. They were scared, and they came after us with fundraisers and attack ads. We knew we hit a bone. I've often been asked in the months since the election if I ever thought my campaign would get national attention and full party support. And the answer is yes, of course. I knew what others didn't because I understood what was inside of me. I understood what my district deserves and I know where we can go if we work hard together. Not only did I expect the party to get involved, we also incorporated when they would get involved into our strategic plan and they delivered. Once, the polling, uh, that, uh, once our polling caught up to what we were seeing on the ground, the DCCC jumped into action, identifying and helping to fill budget gaps, advising us on ad buys, and supporting us every step as we marched to November 8th. So that was the business side of being a candidate, but the experience of being a candidate is down to the voters. They are your cheerleaders on the campaign trail who tell you that they're, you're a role model for their children, or that you're the very first person they've ever met who's running for office. They are the people who openly, honestly, and so vulnerably tell you their struggles, like the two guys who crossed the street uh, from their halfway house to register to vote because after being in prison for a few years, they were ready to roll up their sleeves and get to work. Or the dairy farmer and his wife, strong Christians, who wanted immigration reform that provides a path to citizenship for the Egyptian and Mexican migrants that work so hard on their farm and contribute to their community, our community, to make it a better place. You see people participating in the pro process and for someone who loves democracy and America as much as I do, it is just so very beautiful. And just so you know that I'm not exaggerating, I should tell you that my favorite nerd book is Democracy in America by Alexis de Tocqueville. Um, and Reed and I have to have a conversation afterwards about Sam Huntington, but anyway. Um, and I'm grateful that the campaign was re referred to as the force that is Christina Hartman. But we couldn't have done any of it without the big players and equally a consulting team matching and keeping pace with my ethos and ethic, work ethic. Teamwork makes us incredibly effective and ensure that we change a narrative nearly two centuries old in Pennsylvania's 16th. We use the playbook to build a unique, authentic path for, new, for a new following to travel toward Pennsylvania's 16th inevitably blue trajectory. Of course, this chapter of this story doesn't have the ending I would have liked. As you know, we were swept up in the GOP's victory in Pennsylvania, and I lost. But a loss doesn't mean that we didn't make a lot of gains. We started out with zero dollars and zero cents, and we raised 1.25 million. Going into the last week of the race, our polling had us trailing by only one point. The GOP Super PAC spent 1.1 million dollars to smear me in the last week. And we won the largest number of votes and scored the best performance a Democrat has ever recorded in PA 16. And just this past Janu- oh, thank you. Uh, just this past January, uh, Pennsylvania's 16th was named a 2018 target by the DCCC. So in just 17 months, 17 months, we outperformed expectations and transformed PA 16 from safe Republican to toss up to a bellwether for the nation. And just last week, Rothenberg announced that it will keep PA 16 in the lean's Republican spot. So no longer will Republicans take Pennsylvania's 16th for granted. And no longer will people think it's impossible for a Democrat to win. And most importantly, no longer will the citizens of Lancaster, Chester, and Berks counties have their voices go unheard. A loss does not mean that we quit or acquiesce. It means that we learn and we redouble our efforts. I've learned a lot. I might even do it again. Equally, I think the people around me learned a lot too, that age and gender and background 
Don't diminish what a candidate has to offer. It can, it can enhance it. And big surprise, a solid foundation, smart planning, and hard work, and a little moxie can go a long way. And if we earn strong party support and surround ourselves with the right people, we can reach where the political trajectory of our districts and our country are so obviously pointing us. We are the new generation of, of candidates, and we expect you to join us. Thank you. Thank you.